morning. <clears throat> Up here on the front of the podium, there are Bible reading plans, four of them. You'll find these reading plans outside in the foyer as well on the table out there. We strongly advocate for people reading the Word of God. There's something that happens when you read the Bible all the way through. There are things you discover. There's this thing called biblical perspicuity that you find everywhere. To understand biblical perspicuity, it means that what you read in Genesis, you'll find other places too. What you read in the book of Revelation, you'll find throughout the Bible. A lot of people have questions about Scripture, what it means, how to interpret. I don't want to scare anybody, but let me just say that the Bible interprets itself. It does. So we are advocating that people read through the Word of God at least one time per year. And these Bible reading plans are for your benefit. I encourage you to take a Bible reading plan and put it to use. And if you have not ever read through the entire Bible, please begin to do so and make this the day. Amen. I'm going to be reading today from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 17 in the continuing series on moving forward. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at this time I do pray that you open up the hearts and the minds of everyone that is here this day within the sound of my voice. And God, that the word would be made very clear, understandable, and easy to be applied, that you may receive all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Today we're going to be speaking about moving forward, redeeming the time. I want to open up with a little analogy, if you would. Have you ever been driving down the road... And you see those little red cones that they put in the middle of the road? You like those? <laughs> Driving down the road and they've got these little red cones in, in the roadway. And, you know, they could be annoying, can't they? No comment, right? <laughs> they can be annoying. But I think it's important that we all come to the conclusion that those red cones are there to get our attention. And they do. They get our attention. Those red cones in the road are trying to tell us something. Trying to tell us that we need to be watchful for what's up ahead. Oftentimes when you encounter those cones, you don't necessarily know what's up ahead. But you know that they're there for some reason. Could be that the road that you're figuring on turning on has been detoured. And you have to go a different road, a different route. Could be indicating that there's road construction up ahead. And you've got road workers along the way that you're going to have to be careful of. could tell you that there's been an accident. 
could tell you that two or three lanes might have to be decreased to one lane. And you may have to wait in line for your time to go through wherever this happens. But it's important to recognize that those red cones are there to get our attention. Amen? Amen. When you encounter those red cones, you may not know what's up ahead, but something's going on. So they're important. And that's how Christian life is supposed to be lived. Just like driving down the road, looking at the red cones, wondering what's up ahead, we're to be watchful. There really needed to be an amen right there. <laughs> Help me out. <laughs> we need to be watchful, amen? Because there's pitfalls, there's stairs. There's all kind of things in Christian life that can confront us. That's another place for an amen. amen. Man, maybe you guys need help. And <laughs> That's how Christian life's to be lived, just like driving down the road, watching all the signs along the way, being careful that we turn on to the correct road that we're supposed to turn on. We're to be watchful. We're to be watching all the signs along the way, striving to avoid the pitfalls, the snares of life. God is concerned about the way his people live. Now I know that in talking to different folks along the way that I've run across people who don't believe that. They believe that you can profess Jesus Christ as Savior and go out and live any way you want. But I'm here to tell you that just in case you may be one of those people who believe that, that's not true. And Scripture tells us that that's not true. God is very concerned about how his people live. Verse 15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly. Now there's a word we're going to get into today. Circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. But as wise. Interesting word, circumspectly. Translates the Greek word akrobos which means to walk carefully, to walk accurately. And in context, it means to live according to the will of God. The NASB puts it this way, therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. And whenever we see that word, therefore, we have to come to the conclusion that it's there for a reason. Whenever you see the word, therefore, it always refers to what came before. So what came before is what tells us how we're to walk circumspectly, how we're to walk accurately, how we're to walk exactly, carefully, according to the will of God. So we have to have our attention drawn to what comes before. And for that we go all the way back to chapter 4, believe it or not. You see the book of Ephesians is split down the middle. Three chapters, three chapters. There are six chapters total. The first three chapters talk about theology. The last three chapters tell us how to apply that theology. Pretty important. That's how the book is divided. So the first three chapters focus on theology. The last three chapters focus upon practical application of that theology. So what do we see if we go all the way back to chapter 4? We see in verse 1 through 3, 
we're supposed to walk circumspectly by walking worthy of the vocation to which we've been called. That's number one. Walk worthy of the vocation to which we've been called. What vocation have we been called to? What calling have we been given? We're, calling, we're called to be the people of God. We're called to be the people of God and we're to live like the people of God are supposed to live. We're called to live in humility, in meekness, and in unity of the Spirit. That means, number one, we have to beware of pride. Ouch. You can say that too. Mm -hmm. We have to beware of pride. From verse 14, we see that to walk circumspectly is to not be tossed to and fro with false doctrine. We need to learn the Bible in order to avoid that. That's the only way. That's one of the reasons why we're strongly advocating, strongly pushing Bible reading. Read it through in a year. Then after the year's over, do it again. Keep doing it. To walk circumspectly is to not be tossed to and fro by false doctrine put out there by false teachers. Know the truth. Live the truth. Learn the Bible. Means we have to beware of false teachers. Verse 17 through 32 in Ephesians 4. To walk circumspectly is to not to live as other Gentiles walk. In the vanity of their mind. Beware of vanity. I want to make reference to this word vanity. It translates the Greek word mediatos in most cases. Mediatos means futility, vanity, worthlessness. Participating in things that have no eternal good. In verse 19, you'll see, we're not to be living in lasciviousness. That means licentiousness. Refers to sensuality. Things that are sexually immoral. Also says we're not to be living in any kind of uncleanness or greediness. Verse 22 through 24, we're to be putting off the old man, being renewed in the spirit of our mind, and putting on the new. That being renewed in the spirit of our mind refers again to the Word of God. How has mind renewal happened? By reading God's Word, Amen. by studying God's Word, by understanding God's Word. That's how we're changed. Verse 25, we're to put away lying by speaking the truth. Verse 26 and 27, we're to be angry and not sin. What? I thought anger was sin. A lot of people are probably thinking. Well, it's possible to be angry and not sin. Verse 28, to walk circumspectly, we're to work for what we need. We're to work for what we need. Rather than to steal, we're to work. And we're to work in such a way that we put aside something to give to those who are in need. That's what it means to live circumspectly. Verse 29, of that same chapter, chapter 4. Watch your tongue. Watch your tongue. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Verse 30, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit of God if we're Christian? Easy. Practice disobedience. 
Don't do what the Holy Spirit says to do. Verse 31 and 32 were to be kind and forgiving in order to walk circumspectly. In chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, to walk circumspectly means to be a follower of God. That means we have to beware of idolatry. Verse 3, not being sexually immoral, not being covetous. Verse 4, not given to speaking foolishly. Chapter 5, verse 7 through 14, to walk circumspectly is to not be a partaker of sin. We must beware of spiritual darkness. In verse 9, manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 10, using spiritual discernment, improving that which is good as compared to that which is not. Verse 11, walking in the light of Christ, not in the darkness of the world. So what we learn from all this is as we move forward, we're to watch diligently for traps, snares, that would otherwise entangle us in sin. To walk circumspectly, meaning to walk accurately and exactly for Christ, is to be the wise man, not the fool. Here we get into some very interesting things. It seems that everybody has their own interpretation, their own definition for what a word means. So I'm going to give you the Merriam-Webster definition for a fool. It says someone who is silly and lacking in judgment. Now I'm going to give you the biblical definition of what a fool is. And it might surprise everybody because it's a lot more than being silly and lacking in judgment. Psalm 14, 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool doesn't believe in God. Romans 1, 21 through 23, professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. The fool makes up his own God. You ever know anybody to do that? Make up their own God. Proverbs 122, fools hate knowledge. This, by the way, is speaking about biblical truth, which is biblical knowledge. Fools hate knowledge. Proverbs 14:9, fools mock at sin. That means they scoff at sin as though it were no big deal. That means they're prone to call evil good and to call good evil. Have you ever known a professing believer to believe that abortion is good? that sexual immorality is good, that illicit drugs, alcohol abuse are good. It indicates that there's no change, no regeneration, no being born again in their life, no fruit. Fools mock at sin. 
There are professing believers who do this. Proverbs 15, 2, the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Take a good look at our government. I didn't say that. (laughs) Take a good look at our government. Proverbs 15.5, a a fool despises its father's instruction. That means the fools despise authority. Psalm 74.18, the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. The fool blasphemes God. Proverbs 17, 24, the eyes of the fool are on the ends of the earth. They're trapped by the world. The fool is trapped by worldly things. Ecclesiastes 2, 14, the fool walks in darkness. Speaking of walking in spiritual darkness. Matthew 23, verse 17 and 19, Jesus said the Pharisees were blind fools. That means they're spiritually blind. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit because they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Fools have no biblical discernment. Christians cannot live as a fool. Now we're down to the wise person. There's a word in the English language called philosophy. Philosophy is the love of wisdom, philosophia, love of wisdom. In the Greek, that's what the word means. And in the text we're going to look at right now, this is speaking obviously of worldly wisdom. There's wisdom that comes from God, then there's the other kind, worldly wisdom. Just keep in mind that the world has a different definition of wisdom. Colossians 2 a says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. That's talking about the love of worldly wisdom. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Why should we beware of vain philosophy? Because Christ is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. That's in the very next verse. And what came right before that in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3 is that in him, talking about Jesus Christ, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You don't need worldly philosophy. True wisdom is found in Jesus, not worldly philosophy. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. The wise person walks circumspectly. So here's what the scripture says about the wise person. Proverbs 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wow, repeated itself. When God keeps saying it, I think we're supposed to understand it, pay attention to it. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but knowledge of the holy is understanding. 
We see here that the fear of the Lord is where wisdom begins. What does it mean to have the fear of the Lord? It means to have a reverential awe for God. It means to be awestruck by His splendor, by His glory, by His power, by His very being. It also means to respect those things that God cherishes. That's where wisdom begins. What does God cherish? Things like living a life that honors God. Things like righteousness, holiness, godliness. Things like denying self, taking up the cross daily and following Jesus. Things like striving to enter into the narrow gate. Things like forsaking the world in favor of clinging to Christ. Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Said it again. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. The fear of the Lord results in obedience to God. Job 28, 28. Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. A fourth time? Yeah. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and depart from evil is understanding. To fear the Lord is to depart from evil. We see here that it's the wise person that fears the Lord, has a reverential respect, admiration for God, and the things that are important to God. We're also going to see that it's the wise person who seeks the counsel of the Lord. The wise person seeks the counsel of God, not the counsel of the world. From Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And what does he do with the law of the Lord? He meditates upon it day and night. Focuses on God. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. There's more on what Scripture reveals about the wise person, by the way. Galatians 5.16 I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Those who are wise... Walk in the power of the Spirit of God. Ephesians 4.1, we've already talked about. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you have been called. Those who are wise, walk in the manner that is worthy of their calling to be a Christian. Colossians 2.6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Those who are wise walk by faith in Christ. 1 John 1, 7. But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Those who are wise walk in the light of Christ. Not spiritual darkness. 1 John 2, 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Those who are wise abide in Christ. Any questions? I'm just kidding. (laughs) 
Another way that believers walk circumspectly, that means accurately, exactly as we're supposed to, according to the will of God. Another way that believers walk circumspectly is by redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. Out. few things I need to say about redeeming the time. The word time translates the Greek word to eros, which is not chronos. This is not talking about the clock, as in hours, minutes, and seconds, and days. To eros refers to opportunities, occasions. And to redeem the time means to redeem those occasions, redeem those opportunities that present themselves in order to glorify God. How many distractions can you name? It'll blow your mind. Have you ever thought about how many distractions there are in the world that take our time and our attention away from bringing glory and honor to God? You know, for a sermon that's probably going to be about an hour long, I don't even have time to name all the distractions. It would take more than that. But let me put it this way, in Paul's day, they didn't even have the distractions we have today. Things like television, movies, video games, computers, telephones, iPads, social media. They had other ways to be distracted. But they still had the same overall problem we have today. They needed to be told that they had to take advantage of the opportunities they were given to bring glory and honor to Christ. Take advantage of the opportunities to glorify God. The NASB puts it this way, making the most of your time. The ESV says, making the best use of your time. Making the best use of your opportunity. And we're to make the best use of every opportunity we have because... I think we all know that opportunity soon vanishes away. And opportunity is no more. Do we look for the opportunities to glorify God? Do we have opportunities to glorify God and they just pass by without doing anything to take advantage of the opportunity? Consider the brevity of life. From Psalm 39, verse 4 and 5, there's a prayer. It says, Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days. What it is that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as a hand breath, and my age is as nothing before thee. I think it's telling us that life is short. And we have to recognize that a Christian life is to be used to honor God. Psalm 89, verse 46, remember how short my time is. 
Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach me to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. That we may, in other words, apply our hearts to walking circumspectly like the wise man. James 4.14 For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes away. How do we use our time? This is one thing that I know to be true. Man will make the time to do whatever is most important to him. Man will do whatever it takes to make sure that he does whatever is most important to him. How important is it that we glorify God? It's everything. Life is short, much work to be done, so we're to make the most of our opportunities. The believer return, re, uh, redeems opportunities to glorify God by living righteously as a testimony to Christ, by witnessing and sharing the gospel with those who are lost as a testimony to Christ, by practicing diligence on your job as a testimony to Christ. Have you ever thought about that? You mean to practice diligence on my job brings glory to God? Well, of course. Isn't it true that a Christian ought to be the best laborer in the whole lot? By setting an example of commitment and discipline at work, at home, and among fellow believers as a testimony to Christ. By being faithful to God and family as a testimony to Christ. By speaking out for Christ and the cause of righteousness as a testimony to Christ. And by prayer, by prayer. Because to redeem the time, to walk circumspectly by redeeming the time, we need the help of God. Do you know that we ought to be praying for one another on this issue? I'm serious, serious as could be. We ought to be praying for one another on this issue. The Apostle Paul did. In Acts chapter 3, verse 14 through 21, how about if we all turn there? Acts chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. Notice what Paul writes. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. I may have said Acts before. I meant Ephesians. Pardon me. If you go to Ephesians, you won't find what we're looking at. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. <laughs> Positive. For this cause I bow my knees. That means Paul is praying. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened 
Anybody here needs spiritual strength? Let me just say we all do. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That needs to be our prayer for one another. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That being rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. What a prayer. Paul's praying for the Christians in Ephesus. He prays for them for spiritual strength that's needed for serving Jesus. He prays for them to have greater faith. That they would be well grounded in the love of God. And comprehend more fully the love of Christ. That they would be filled with the fullness of God. Amen. Prayed for the church. Because his concern was for the believers. His concern was for believers' spiritual growth and development. Prayer is an awesome way to redeem the time. And notice it says we're to redeem the time because the days are evil. How many can agree that the days are evil? A day when evil is called good and good is called evil. A day when people profess themselves to be wise, when in reality they're fools. A day in which even those in the church are lovers of money, lovers of self, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. A day in which The entire world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 1 John 5, 19. A day in which the God of this world blinds people to the truth of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Is it not true that we cannot sit idly by and just watch the world go by? must redeem the time. We live in a world that is engulfed in evil and rather than complaining about it, let's do something about it. Let's redeem the time. Let's walk circumspectly. Redeem the opportunity to glorify Christ. Let's move forward. Are you ready to take the lead by setting a Christian example for others to follow? That's redeeming the time. Are you ready to take the lead moving forward by diligently serving Christ, by ministering to the lost, ministering the love of God, to those who are in need. Are you ready to move forward by taking the lead and being diligent to help a world that is reeling under the weight of sin, suffering, death? Are you ready to move forward by taking the lead in providing hope that can only be found in Christ Jesus? The evil of the world is ever before us. Our task 
is to make the most of every opportunity because opportunity will one day pass. Nobody knows when opportunity will come to an end. Nobody knows when opportunity will come to an end. Nobody knows what will cause it to come to an end. Could be because of sickness and health issues. Could be because of persecution. Could be because of trials and tribulations. Could be because we die. But one day opportunity will be gone. One day or another. Be assured that the opportunity to witness will pass. The opportunity to be diligent will pass. The opportunity to speak up will pass. The opportunity to exhibit the love of God will pass. The opportunity to minister and serve God will pass. The opportunity to work hard for the kingdom of God will one day pass, be assured. So many opportunities are lost because of distraction. And the call is to redeem the time. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 29 through 31. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. Amen. Time is short. This I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives should be as though they had none. They that have those that weep should be as though they wept not. Those that rejoice as though they rejoice not. Those that buy as though they possess not. And they that use this world is not abusing it. For the form of this world passeth away. How do we avoid distraction? <laughs> Second Corinthians 10.5 Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. What does it mean by casting down imaginations? Quite frankly, it means casting down, throwing out human speculation. Throwing out human speculation and taking every thought captive to Christ. Casting down everything that's lofty, everything that exalts itself above Christ. Throwing it out. That's how you avoid distraction. To avoid distraction, Philippians 4.8. Think upon whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Amen. To avoid distraction, we must be committed to walk in wisdom to those who are outside the faith. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward those who are without, and that means outside, outside the faith, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech be always with grace. Seasoned with salt, you may know how you ought to answer every man. To avoid distraction, this is a word to those who are young. That means not me. <laughs> a word to those who are young. 
to avoid distraction. Those who are young must remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Ecclesiastes 12.1 Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth while the days, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Young people, use the strength, the energy, the vitality, the vigor that you have to honor God. Because the day will come when you grow older, you grow more tired, more fatigued. To avoid distraction, we must say to God, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our heart to wisdom. So what did the Apostle Paul do to redeem the time? Well, like a good preacher would do, he did what he preached. In redeeming the opportunities that he was given, Paul became all things to all men for the purpose of that he may win some to Christ. His concern was for the eternal souls of those who were lost and headed for hellfire and damnation. They were the focus of his attention in his work for the kingdom. In his sight, they mattered. They mattered because they needed to be saved, and Paul personally knew the one who could save them. Our response must be likewise. Opportunity is brief. There's much to be done. Let us redeem the time. Making the most of the opportunities that we are given to do the work of the kingdom. And lest we forget, there's this other thing that I touched on a little earlier. We must redeem the time through the power of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13, it is written, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. All of it. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. There's an interesting word, wiles. It comes from the Greek word methodeia. And it's where we get our word method. Some translations use the word schemes. Satan has schemes, doesn't he? He has methods that he uses. How many would agree with me that one of the primary methods he uses is distraction? All he has to do is keep us busy. He's really good at it. But let's be busy for the Lord. Not doing the work of Satan. Satan's desire is to take us down a different road. The road we're supposed to be following is Christ. When Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life, that word way translates, translates the Greek word hodos. That means road. Jesus said, I am the road. Let's be sure to stay on that road. Finally, my brethren, be strong of the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. You may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now get this, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Really? You mean we're not in a wrestling match with people? No. (coughs) 
We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Principalities translates the word arche. In context, it's talking about arch demons, chief demons. You mean they have those? Yeah. Chief demons. Powers translates the Greek word exousia, which means demonic authorities. Demons that have authority over certain areas. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world, cosmocrator. A reference to Satan and his demons. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle against demons. We need to put on the full armor of God to withstand the wiles of Satan. We need to be redeeming the time by standing against the wiles of Satan. John 8:44 says about Satan that he is a liar, that he is a murderer. Don't be deceived. Don't be lulled to sleep. Romans 13, 11. Now it is high time to awaken out of sleep. Now it is high time to awaken out of sleep. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Amen. Let us redeem the time. Hell is forever. Hell is real, and the world needs Jesus. Verse 17 says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The will of God is explained in these three verses. To walk in wisdom, to walk circumspectly, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Let us commit to moving forward in the power of Christ with every head bowed and every eye closed. Father in heaven, that you would commit your word, that you would commit your word to our hearts. that we would be conformed into the image of Christ according to the will of God. Father, if there's any that are here this day who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, may this be the day of their salvation. Lord, if there are any who are here this day and who are living the life of a pagan, Lord, that this would be the day of their salvation. Our prayer is that you would receive all glory, honor, and praise. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen.